I mean, I shoot this as far as the chips. It's been a shortage of chips. So they said it's been a shortage of chips for a long time. For the average person, can you just explain, like, why are chips so important and why is there such a shortage of chips? Because it's like it, it, they could be made. It's not like a, a vegetable that has to grow in the ground, right? If you could just make, if you can make a chip, why is there shortages of chips? Why don't they just make more chips? Yeah, no, uh, uh, another good question. Like I, um, once I started at NVIDIA, I had spent a lot of time digging into this because for that same reason, it's like, well, what are the challenges here? So in short, in short, and I can talk to why the chips are so important as well, but in short, um, the reason why these fabs are important and why they're so expensive, one is that they're humongous operations, um, absolutely um, uh, uh, gargantuan efforts, process, uh, 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 structures, and everything in order to um, uh, build chips in the right way. Um, and so, you know, you can't just stand up a fab and then just go next door and then stand up another one. There is a whole lead time and capability there. The second is that Taiwan has that we didn't have and are starting to build is the pipeline of um, uh, intellectual capability and intellectual mm -hmm. capital to work on these chips. So you're right. Rashad, and that a chip is a physical thing and there is a blueprint to building a chip. And we've been doing that for a while. I started my career at Motorola. We've been building chips. Motorola, many don't know this, but Motorola used to be the processor inside of Apple's, right? Mm -hmm. So we've been building chips. America has been building chips. But what happened was, I'm showing my age, but when I was at Motorola, we were doing a lot of the chip development here. We moved that abroad because we wanted to, we, we turned our eye, our gaze on other capability on the software side. And so we said, let let's outsource the hardware side. Let's push that out to, um, and let Taiwan have it. What they wound up building are universities, research institutions, and other capabilities that support chip making. So you have to have the intellectual capital and the intellectual environment. It's just like any large company. No large company just decides to move to a location just because, you know what? It seems like um, there's gonna be a nice view out the window. Right. They look at what universities are there, what high schools are there, what's the graduation rate across mm -hmm. um, in the pipeline here, because they want um, that talent uh, to be groomed and groomed. What sort of are you just all uh, uh, liberal arts universities or is there are there a lot of tech um, uh, majors in these universities? That's what companies think about. And so when you look at Taiwan, Taiwan has the whole ecosystem. So we have to create the ecosystem from the begin, uh, from the bottom up. So it's not just the physical chips, the development, it's also the intellectual capital in order to um, build the best chips and to, and to compete. So, it, I mean, that's kind of one of those things where when we see reports that we see TSM, they're building their foundries in Arizona and it's costing $20 billion. But one of the things that we, that I think you and I discussed and maybe Ian, you were part of that conversation as well is, the American companies that are doing it. And so obviously yeah. we see NVIDIA, but we see companies like Global Foundries and having these fabs. So for those not in the know, fabs are where these chips are made, but it's a long process and it's an expensive process. We're talking tens and twenties of billions of dollars to build the factory, which probably takes five to six years, then getting the machinery and then finding the infrastructure that goes inside that. Right. But I want to go back to, you said you were at NVIDIA and this is one of the things that really stuck with me when we spoke was, how many employees, how many black employees were at NVIDIA when you were there? <laughs> Let's start there. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, um, I'm going to put it like this. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I started, there were 17,000 employees at NVIDIA um, globally. When you're talking about African-American, because we have a presence in Africa, um, but when you're talking about African-American, it was less than 50 at the time that I started. I think it's a little over 100, maybe 120 or so now. Might be a little bit more since I left. Yeah. Last I checked. Um, but it was, it was less than 50, far less than 50, like an astonishing number lower than 50. But I, I you know, um, um, I don't want to say an exact number because then someone could refute that exact number. Yeah. But I'm telling you, it was uh, a bizarre amount um, yeah. of African-Americans. I, I, I preface that question because it, it speaks to 
kind of the you know we we've, we've had these conversations around solutions for the future, and one of them is having us being in the tech world, right? Obviously, we're doing yeah. our part as far as finance and many others are helping along the way to get more of us in these fields that you know there's a, a lack thereof. And so I want you to talk about having us really finding our way and finding methods in, in, in studies to be in tech, specifically, obviously, in AI, which is which is something of the future, the importance of it, because there's at one point, I, I, I recall you trying to, you're at NVIDIA and trying to give out these supercomputers to New York yeah. City, but you didn't have anybody to give it to because there wasn't anybody that was educated in the space. So talk about that. Yeah, no. Um... So I, I, I don't even know where to start with, with your question. It's, it's such a big point and, and, and question mark uh, for our community. Um, but let me start from that point that you ended with, which was, so when I was at NVIDIA, and NVIDIA is like uh, Apple. I mean, they don't give away anything. There's no, <laughs> they don't give nothing away. Um, and that, you know, Jensen never gave money. Uh, you know, donations, not, I don't know what he does personally, but I mean, as a NVIDIA, you know, people come and organizations come and say, hey, if you get 50,000, you can be a part of this pro this effort to do blah, 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 blah. It was always like a no. Um, so we never gave anything away, um, but I had gotten my hands on um, the, 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 we were, um, long story short, I got my hands on four DGXs, which four DGXs, uh, it connected together with the right networking environment is a supercomputer, has the capability and the power of a supercomputer. And so I was given the green light to donate that to a city uh, of my desire. And I started to think about where could we put this? I wanted to put these not with a city government, I wanted to put them with organizations within the city, and I wanted to put them in a city where there was HBCUs, um, and 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 people can from the community can use this supercomputer. Um, I had no luck, zero luck, right? Wound up having to put them at um, they're at Cornell Tech right now. Um, mm. That's where they landed. My only two options was NYU and Cornell Tech in New York City, and then being able to get people from the community to use them is a whole nother capacity building exercise. And so we realize how far behind we are in utilizing supercompute. So there's a pipeline and this is getting to what you're talking about. And you guys have talked about this a lot. There's a pipeline that I see in this AI space. And this is a fairly high level pipeline. It probably can be broken down to more atomic parts. There's a pipeline and the pipeline is this, um, this infrastructure. And that's your NVIDIAs, um, uh, that's, that's going to, you know, that's your ARM, uh, Qualcomm, um, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, those folks. That's infrastructure. Then you have your platform companies, right? Google plays in the platform space as well as in the infrastructure place, space, right? NVIDIA is moving uh, aggressively into the platform space. So you have all of these platform companies. OpenAI is a platform company that is considering becoming an infrastructure company. So, you know, there's this, but there's infrastructure, platform, and then there is um, um, users, consumers of these AI products. So when we talk about our community, we are over-indexed, woefully over-indexed on the user side. We always talk about how did you use ChatGPT? How did you use Bard? How did you use Claw2? So on and so forth, as opposed to um, how are people using what we've built? Um, and so there is a, but there are reasons, structural, um, structural reasons, infrastructure reasons, academic reasons. Um, the ecosystem has to exist um, for us to play in this space. And so it's very challenging. So it's really difficult to have a supercomputer and go to a community and say, you have access to about two and a half million dollars worth of compute, period, point blank, on the street. And that was before, that was when the stock was at one something. That was before yeah. it popped. Um, people were looking at me um, when the stock popped and no one could get any DGXs or any GPUs. They were looking at me like, yo, I mean, well, you, 
uh, why don't you bring those back? Right? Because we there was this right now there's like a nine, ten month lead time to even get any of those DGXs, of which four of them I gave to New York City. But I had two and a half million dollars worth of supercompute power, and you couldn't you couldn't convince people um, from our community to use them um, for a lot of reasons. It's not it's not their fault, but it but it helped uh, shine shine light on the environment that we're in. 